Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Thursday, June 2nd, 2011, and our special guest tonight is Cal Newport, the author of How to Be a High School Superstar. Cal, thanks so much for being here. Well, I'm happy to do it. I'm excited. I have to tell you, I really love this book. Uh, the Future of Education is sponsored in part by my employer, Blackboard. Uh, the project is called Blackboard Collaborate, what used to be Wimbun Illuminate. The newest version of uh, Blackboard Collaborate comes out uh, at um, the beginning of July, so it should be a lot of fun. The Future of Education interview series is also sponsored by my Web 2.0 Labs project. That's web20.com. Coming up in Philadelphia, if you're going to be in the Philadelphia area or you're planning on attending ISD, please do join us at EduBloggerCon, the all-day unconference on social media and education. That's Saturday, June 25th from 8 to 5 p.m. It is free. You do not need to be registered for ISTE to attend. If you are going to ISTE, we have the Bloggers Cafe, which is a blast. If you haven't been, you'll love it. And we have the ISTE Unplugged area. Anybody can present. Go to SDUnplugged.com to sign up. Not only do you get to present on site at ISTE, but we stream it live through Illuminate. We have announced the dates for our 2011 Global Education Conference, November 14th to 18th. Uh, <laughs> again, this is well worth doing. Free, five days, 24 hours a day, just a blast, uh, all in Illuminate. And uh, I'm going to be talking about this on the Saturday live show. This is this coming Saturday, the Classroom 2.0 live show. But Teacher 2.0 is a new network we've created to help educators use the web to um, for their own personal and professional growth. In fact, there's a lot in this book that you would find very interesting uh, from an, an adult, non-student perspective. And maybe we'll talk about that a little. Anyway, that's teacher20.com. And if you're in the Sacramento area, I am going to be running a uh, an experimental all-day workshop on June 17th, a Teacher 2.0 workshop. I'm looking to get some good feedback on that. Coming up next week on the Future of Education, the authors of The Invisible Gorilla, uh, a book that really opened the doors to me in terms of thinking about uh, cognitive issues and education. Not a book about education, but nevertheless a fascinating book. May one of my favorites, I keep saying. So uh, that's uh, next Tuesday and next Thursday. Troy Hicks on because digital writing matters. Um, those of you who maybe have read How to Be a High School Superstar will recognize that Denise Pope is coming on uh, June 16th. Um, lots of other good interviews coming up. And um, Howard Gardner just agreed to do an interview in September. So. Lots more fun. If you've missed one of our interviews, they are all recorded. Uh, they're up in full Illuminate version and in MP3 form. Last night's panel discussion on unschooling was fabulous. Uh, Clark, Monica, Lisa, and Kate uh, contributed in terrific ways. Uh, before that, we heard from Jim Bosco on the MacArthur-sponsored research on digital media and participation. Uh, Sir Ken Robinson before that, Steve Denning on his book Radical Management. Chris Gillibo, who's mentioned in this book as well, um, on the art of nonconformity. You can see lots of great material, hopefully something that will be of interest to you. If this is your first time in Illuminate, we're sure glad to have you here. It is participatory. You can put um, notes in the chat. If you'll notice, the chat box looks pretty small on the screen. So I recommend going up to View Layouts and switching yourself to the Wide Layout. It will make quite a difference for following the chat. At the bottom of the participant window are these emoticons, the smiley face. You can see that I'm doing the clapping hand. These are ways of you to express how you're feeling. There is a frowny face and a thumbs down, but we don't expect a lot of that. To the left of those is a hand with a green up arrow. You can use that to raise your hand to ask for the microphone later if you'd like to take the microphone to ask a question. Of course, you can also put questions in the chat. Do be aware that sometimes it's hard for me to be doing the interview and seeing a question. So if I miss a question in the chat, then uh, please feel free to post it again. Now we're going to give you a little bit of a chance, those of you who are in the show live, to let us know where you're listening from. Look to the left of the map. You'll see a wand, it's a blue wand with a red star at the end. Click on that and then click on the map to let us know where you're participating from. Feel free to also shout out in the chat. Let's 
So Atlanta, China, I'm guessing Singapore, Australia, New Zealand. Chicago, Sydney, Boston, Brooklyn, Hong Kong, how fun, wherever you're listening from, and if you're listening to the recording, we sure appreciate your participating. So Cal, I'm, I'm going to start off by saying that although this is a book for students, it's kind of disguised to me in a couple of ways. Uh, we'll talk about sort of the philosophy of the book related to students, but I also felt like this was a book for adults. Has anybody else said anything to you about that? Yeah, I've heard that quite a few times before. Um, an interesting backstory to this book is that when it was originally proposed to Random House, it was proposed to cover all of education. So starting in high school and through graduate school. And I was a graduate student at the time that I was writing this proposal. Um, so it, the ideas were broader. We focused it just because it would be easier. We felt like that was too many books in one. But I think you're picking up that reality that this was really a much broader idea that I'd encountered in my work in education. And this book is just taking a broad idea and applying it to one sort of narrower uh, setting. Well, for me, it was uh, not just that this is a really helpful book for adults who are helping students, but I actually felt like this book helped me in my own life, that there were principles in the book that are universal beyond uh, our academic lives. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. I mean, these are principles that um, I live by. Um, I guess one of my now I'm a, I'm a postdoc. I'm about to become a professor, so I guess it, I could count as an adult. <laughs> Finally, though, I am somewhat young. I live by a lot of the principles in this book too. Uh, it's not surprising to me, though. Often, the sort of the 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 ideas with impact usually are broad. I need to make you aware of a couple of things. Um, my dad was dean of admissions at Stanford and then dean of admissions at Princeton. And uh, before you discover that in some way on your own, I want you to know uh, that that's the case. He is now retired. Um, but I did not talk to him about the book at all. I didn't want you to think that I'd actually had a conversation with him. I will after the interview. Um, but you mentioned Stanford and Princeton so heavily in the book. I thought, well, I don't want him to be surprised by that. OK, I, yeah, I feel myself warned. I feel good because I actually just heard, I think yesterday, from the former director of admissions from an Ivy League school to remain unnamed. And he said, you know, that book hit on a lot of ideas uh, that sounded true. So I, I have some confidence. I hope that your dad won't be too disappointed. No, I think he'll like it quite a bit. Um, so you, the, the book is really about the um, taking a different approach to tackling admission stress. And one of the things that you talk about in the book, both at the beginning and, then, and at the end, is that uh, the, the way in which we talk about admission stress isn't necessarily helping people to overcome it. Um, why is that? Yeah, I think it's a good point. You know, I just sat on this panel uh, here in Boston with um, Vicki Abels and the director of Race to Nowhere and Alfie Cohen, and we, we, we screened the movie Race to Nowhere and had this panel discussion afterwards. Um, and I, I really enjoyed the movie. You know, this is a movie about stress in, in high school. But what, I, what was hitting me in the discussion, in the panel section, the back and forth, is that all the ideas that people were throwing out um, were these either large systemic changes, you know, we need to change the way we educate students. We need to change the structure of the high school experience. We have to change the way colleges do admissions. Or they were thoughts on how we can change whole cultures. We need to take students and redefine their definitions of success, what have you. And what I was thinking is, you know, I found in my experience, which is almost entirely one-on-one -on -one interaction. I do one-on-one -on -one interaction with students because of these books. I work with about 1,000 students a year one-on-one -on -one over email, is that these were exactly the strategies that those sound good or more or less ignored by the people who need the help most, which are the people who uh, have been told they have this talent, and they do have talent, 
and, and it's very important to them, this idea is very important to their family that they try to go to a, a good college and, and, and take advantage of this talent. And I had found that this crowd basically wasn't interested in being told, change your definition of success. They would ignore that. Uh, and I'm sure they were happy to hear there was going to one day be these large systemic changes to the structure of schools, but that wasn't going to help them this week or next month. So my approach was to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to take a different tact. And I'm going to find the students who uh, did fine in college admissions, but somehow still managed to be pretty happy. And I'm going to say, well, what did you guys do different? And that was the whole approach I took for this book. So it's a little bit different than the sort of big idea changes to education and culture approaches that, that have gained a lot of traction recently. So that existed for me in the book at two levels. One was that you, you know, essentially the book is, we know you want to get into a good college, so here's how to do it. The second sort of quieter level, but the deeper one is, if you actually kind of rethink your goals, you'll find that college becomes, the getting into a school that's a good school for you, actually becomes the result of living a better life. But clearly the book is kind of marketing itself to the student's aspirations to get into a good school. Yeah, I like to say um, in my, my work with students, my writing, especially with this book, my number one metric is uh, reducing stress in students, right? making their lives better. So if I come at it like a scientist and say, how can I maximize the amount of stress I can reduce, what I found from my experience on one-on-one -on -one interacting with students is to start right off the bat and say, that's great, you want to go to Harvard, I'm not going to change your ambition. All right, now they're in the door. Right, you, now they'll listen to you. They, they, they know that you're not just another person, you know, not another Ivy League educated person who's looking back at the people before them and saying, don't do what I did, it's too stressful. So that gets them in the door, and then they'll listen. And then I'll say, okay, now let's talk about your strategies, and you know, actually, this is a better strategy for getting in, and this is a better strategy. And as you said, it's sort of a secondary effect. This is sort of what's going on right beneath the uh, surface of this advice is that it leads to a life that's better and that's more fulfilling and more interesting. And not just in high school, but in college. You're going to avoid the, the deep procrastination, burnout issues in college. You're going to go on and have a more interesting life after graduation. And that's all bubbling under the surface. Um, but because my metric is stress reduction, as you mentioned, I approach it by saying, I'm not going to change your ambition. I don't care what your ambition is. That's fine. Let's, let's keep that fine. And now let's start talking about strategies to work better. And this Trojan horse uh, approach, you know, at least in my sort of one-on-one -on -one experience, is somewhat phenomenally successful. Students who are really, really stressed become much less stressed. Well, I really liked it. Um, I mean, obviously, you could have titled the book um, How to Be a Better Person and Enjoy Life Better, but I, I don't think it would have had the impact. I also liked it because in, in a very sort of pragmatic way, it puts students in the driver's seat. And you know, I, as I read the book, I made all of these notes about you know, how you, know, you could even do workshops. And this, this is very sort of a direct approach in helping students kind of take control of their education. Um, is that an accurate perception? Yeah, I think that is accurate. I, I think that comes from the fact that um, most of my interaction with students is direct to students and not uh, mediated through parents. And I think that comes through in my writing. Because this is how I'm used to working with students, is them coming to me and saying, here's my problem, here's my, what I'm stressed about. And me saying, OK, here's practical things you can do. Um, but I think that's nice. I think there's almost a lack of that in the, in the college stress debate. Like this was a question I had, for example. Again, I said I really enjoyed the movie Race to Nowhere because I thought it was very personal at times. I thought it was a really well-crafted look at this issue. But I kept looking from my point of view, well, where's the scenes at the end <laughs> where they show the student that's not stressed out and say, what did you do today, practically speaking? You know, how did you choose your classes? Well, how do you avoid being stressed out? Um, I'm just attracted to that practical advice, the thing that you can tell a student in an email that they can put into practice later that day and then feel better about it uh, the next morning. You know, I'm sort of obsessed with that practical advice. And there is kind of a lack of it in the discussion. So I'm glad you picked up on that. We did have Vicky on the show to talk about Race to Nowhere. And I really like 
you, you know, your book in many ways kind of answers the question that her, that Race to Nowhere raises. Um, it, you know, it gives some practical answers. So you spent three years sort of talking and interviewing students who um, had had this kind of success that, that you defined. And you call them relaxed superstars. Um, and it seems that you yourself probably fit into that same category. So what is a relaxed superstar? Right, so I define it as a student who did well in the college admissions process based on their criteria, which is usually they got into the schools they considered to be REIT schools uh, for themselves. So it varies depending on the student, but a lot of these were um, pretty elite schools. Yet at the same time, they lived lives um, that they felt like were authentic was one key descriptor, another was uncluttered. So they didn't have the sense of always running around from one thing to the other. And because of that, where lives were pretty low stress uh, and pretty happy. So these are the students that interest me, and they're sort of the star of this book. Um, from those interviews, you identify sort of three basic laws that um, are, are the core to your advice to student. And the first of that is the law of underscheduling. Why is that the foundation? Yes, I'm a yes. I'm a sort of fanatic for underscheduling. Um, so the law of underscheduling, which is sort of I derive from the lives of these students, is that you should have less in your schedule than time. In some sense, you should have more than enough time to do what's in your schedule. You should enjoy a sort of abundance of free time in your schedule. That's the sort of advice. And then, of course, the question is, why is this a good thing to do? I mean, it's obvious why this might be a good thing to do if you want to be less stressed. But why is this a good thing to do if you also want to be successful academically and in the college admissions process? And there's some interesting ideas that come up when you look into underscheduling, because it's something that all these relaxed superstars do. And it turns out here was sort of the, the chain of events that happened. So students, uh, these students bring down their schedules. They underschedule. They do a very small number of activities. They do reasonable course loads and efficient study habits. So they have plenty of time to spend on the small number of things they do. And what tends to happen is that when they do that, and the research uh, bears this out, that when you begin to put a lot of time on something, it has a way of converting into becoming what I call a deep interest in the book, but which basically means an activity that over time becomes a sort of part of your identity. Right? It's a, it sort of becomes a, this is part of what I do, part of what I'm about. And these deep interests then become sort of the foundation for making the student into just a, an interesting person, an engaged person, a person who's engaged in the world. And as I found, this is sort of like rocket fuel, not just for a really interesting life, but also turns out to be rocket fuel for a, a college application, to, to actually be an interesting person who's actually engaged in, in, in certain parts of the world in an authentic way is one of the most important things you can do if you want to be impressive from the point of view of an admissions officer. So doing less and giving yourself the time and flexibility to really explore one thing is really the foundation of that, that sort of key trait. So it's interesting because um, by having what, that, what you call casual leisure time, um, it allows there to there allows for there to be things that come up that you can follow up on, that the student can get interested in and follow up on. And uh, that uh, doesn't always lead in the directions that you think you're going to go when you start, but it seems to be kind of a part of this larger life lesson of allowing yourself to explore and find things. And because of that, you actually kind of uh, talk about that you don't like this sense of of finding students' passions. And if I've gotten that right, what you're saying is th that sometimes you, you really can't define what you're going to find interesting until some time has gone by. Yeah, I think it's a very important point. Um, I very much dislike the word passion. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that it's natural. I don't think that it's common for a 15 or 16-year-old to have a pre-existing passion that just needs to be unearthed. And once they unearth it and, and follow it, then everything will be good. That's just not the way that for the vast majority of cases that, that, that things work out. Here's what I found. And I got this research. Actually, I talked to this very, it's a professor. Her name was Linda Caldwell. And she was a professor of leisure studies, actually, at Penn State. So she's sort of a world expert on how people use their free time. And I asked her, how do people develop these type of deep interests that later on people would describe as passion? 
and she's sort of a specialist in this. And what she told me was exactly what you said there. She said, well, the research all says the same thing. They open themselves up to lots of different things, and they have the uh, freedom and flexibility in their schedule to follow up on something that happens to catch their attention. The research says you do this enough, eventually one of those things that catches your attention and that you follow up on sticks. And this is the way they talk about it in sort of the anecdotes in the sort of academic papers, is that there's this, oh, you follow up on it, and then you kind of find yourself the next day, you come back to it again, let me look at this. And then, then the next week, and you kind of put aside a day to look at this. And then a month later, you're doing it regularly. And then six months later, it's a part of your identity. And someone would say, oh, yeah, you're passionate about this. And I think that's a much better way of looking at it, that the origins of passions are often somewhat random and not all that interesting. And that therefore, you shouldn't get too caught up in trying to identify in advance this is what I'm meant to do, or this is what I'm going to do that makes me interesting. In some sense, the research says it makes a lot, um, like much better sense to just go out there, start exposing yourself to interesting things, following up, and see what sticks. So it's a little bit less sexy, uh, but this is what you see when you study the lives of these relaxed superstars. And it was really easy for me to translate that into sort of adult life and how often our jobs kind of demand that we are so consumed that we don't have the chance to actually find things that would develop our interests and allow us then to sort of move forward in different paths and, and flourish. Again, we're not talking about the adults in the book, but I, that was a connection that was made for me. Um, at the end of the section on underscheduling, which is the first of the three laws, you have uh, the playbook. And you have a playbook at the end of each of the three sections. And the first part of the playbook for me in underscheduling was what you call the student workday. So what's the student workday? It was a, a sort of heuristic to help students get a sense of, of what it means to be under schedule. So the student workday heuristic was um, you have picked in advance sort of when your day as a student is going to begin and when your day is going to end. And I recommended dinner. And your goal was to get your your work, your schoolwork, your homework, your extracurriculars to fit in that day. So you're going to start with that goal and then work backwards to see how to make that happen. I, I, I really like that. So there's the work day. Uh, then you have a whole set of techniques for studying well. Did those come from your other books? Yeah, so I, they do. Um, so what I found is, so the book I wrote before this was called um, How to Be a Straight-A Student, and it was in, entirely for college students. I went out and found 50 college students who had phenomenal grades and yet didn't seem too stressed about their academic lives. So you can kind of see a trend here in the type of books I'm interested in writing. Um, and I found that the, that advice wasn't um, applying uh, directly all the time to the lives of high school students who are reading it. So in some sense, that section of the playbook was my attempt to take the study advice that I had originally developed working with college students and, and then adjust it to what made sense for the high school setting. And tell us about Activity Andy. Right, so I'll put this all in context. So we have this goal. You want to have a student work day. And I say your goal should be you want to be done with your work by dinner. For most students who are, uh, say, going after admissions to a, a tier one college, right after they set that goal, they're not going to come close to meeting it. Right? Their, their work, their activities, their schedule is taking them late into the night. That's the standard. So then the question is, well, how do we get down to meeting that student workday goal? And the first step I say is, well, you've got to just become a better studier. So I spend all these pages talking about how to become a more efficient studier. I mean, you can't have Facebook open. You have to take smarter notes. You have to do active recall, not passive recall. So now that's brought down your work closer to the student workday. But let's say you're not there yet. What's the next thing you can do? Well, this is when I talk about it's time to start dropping activities, right? It's, it's time to start under scheduling. And the most useful heuristic I can give to a student who is interested in college admissions is to take each activity and imagine a sort of bland, sort of boring, middle of the road student named Andy. If this activity is something he could be doing, you know, it's just something where you're signed up, you're just kind of showing up, going through the motions, then drop it. Right? So that's my heuristic for reducing the activities that you have. 
So it comes up later in the book, but I really loved the, the piece of if it's already an established program for students, don't do it. Why would you tell people not to do that? Yeah, it's interesting. If you start studying um, how these relaxed superstars end up in the type of activities they do, some interesting ideas come up. So I should get specific. So I'll give you uh, uh, an example student. So like one of the students I talk about in the book, um, his name is Manish, and he went to Stanford. He was definitely an underscheduled student. In fact, he was so underscheduled that he somehow arranged a class schedule his senior year that allowed him to leave at, uh, after lunchtime and be done with his school day. Not to go do some program, he just had talked him into this somehow. <laughs> so he was an underscheduled student. Um, but the thing he did that, that made him really interesting to the Stanford and just to me and to the world in general is that he had written this book called Computer Game Programming for Teens. You know, that was published by a, a major technical publisher and had done well and was a bestseller in Poland for some reason and it got him a recurring spot on a TV show on the tech TV cable channel. So it, it made him into this really interesting kid. So I was interested in those type of activities, right? What makes those interesting? What, how do people get involved with them? And sort of the first rule for getting involved in this sort of really interesting activities in your life is that you're not going to get there by joining places with established structures. So if you're going to join, I want to be whatever, a candy striper, and you've had tens of thousands of high school students come through this program, and it's very clear what it is, you're not going to end up on the other side of that experience on TV in some sense. right? So when I started writing, this was mainly in the third part of the book about how students got involved in these innovative activities. That was kind of the foundational rule. You're probably going to have to turn your sights away from the things that already exist with standard, well-defined structures for high school students. Which I don't think, I don't think you're saying that candy striping isn't good, but I think I made a bridged connection here with uh, activities that are sort of already established for students are probably less likely to provide the kind of apprenticeship and mentoring that would allow for really deep interest to develop. Do you think that's, uh, do you think I made the right connection? I think that's part of it. I think also as part of it is if, if you're starting something that there's not an established program for, there's more flexibility would probably be the word that that I would hone in on. So when you come into, a, say, an organization, so I talk, for example, to give you another example about a student who ended up being basically in charge of the press for this advocacy group and ended up going to a UN conference in Johannesburg, South Africa, and then he ended up at um, Columbia. Uh, this was an example of an organization that didn't have room, you know, a program for a high school student. But because of that, he could be more flexible. So when he came in and, and he got tutored, you know, had some mentorship, but did really well and really earned their respect, he had a lot more options of where he could go next. And he could say, well, why don't I do this next? And then when he did that well, he's like, well, let me just suggest, why don't I take on this project next? And that flexibility allowed him to go to much more interesting places than if that same organization had a high school internship program. The walls there are rigid. So no matter how well you do, you can't escape those rigid walls. So I'm, I'm very attracted to that notion of flexibility, that if you don't have rigid walls, you can end up in uh, much more interesting places. OK, so moving on, your second law is the law of focus. And there's the superstar effect, the Matthew effect, and counter signaling. So what's the superstar effect? So if you under schedule, I, you know, the, you're now doing a small number of things. So now you have maybe one activity as a student or two that you're really focusing a lot of attention on. It's something that's becoming a deep interest. So the question uh, I get often is students get worried. And they say, you know, more is better than less. If I'm doing one thing, that's OK. But if I was doing two things, that'd be even more impressive. So they get very worried about being under schedule. This is where students tend to, to jump ship off the under scheduling ship. So the superstar effect is trying to explain, if you take your one thing and you stick with it, and you, you become really good at it, and let's say you really become the, the, the best person at that particular thing that, say, an admissions officer or someone has seen, you get this bonus for that. And this is a well-known effect in the, in the sort of economic research, and they call it the superstar effect. 
um, you get this sort of bonus of impressiveness around it that is going to make you actually a much more interesting, impressive person than if you had instead done three or four things but weren't particularly great at any of them. So it's my way of arguing to the student that uh, take your energy, put it all in one thing, you actually end up ahead than if you take that same amount of energy and divide it among more things. So it's part of, that was my sort of first argument in trying to keep the student committed to underscheduling. So then the second argument, the Matthew effect, comes from the New Testament scripture. And how does that relate? What, what, what is that next step? Right, so the Matthew effect, and this came out of the, the, uh, the research literature decades ago, but then Malcolm Gladwell popularized it some, uh, I guess, in outliers. Um, but basically what that says uh, in the context of students is once you start doing something really well, sort of related accomplishments are, in essence, handed to you for almost no additional effort. And I, I think this is something common common to people from life out of school as well, once you become known for something, once you've done something really well, that leads to lots of interesting, impressive opportunities. So that's my second piece in the argument for why you should do less. Right? So you stick with one thing, you get the bonus from the superstar effect. In addition, other interesting opportunities will arrive and they'll come basically for free, that's the Matthew effect. Where again, if you had divided that same attention among multiple things, you wouldn't have gotten to the level that triggers that effect. So that's sort of the, the second argument I was giving to the students that, you know what, stick with a small number of things. What is counter-signaling? And this is my third argument for why you should stick with a small number of things. Um, and this is a really interesting uh, piece of literature that this again came out of the economics research where a lot of the more interesting social research seems to be coming out of these days. But this study that was from 2001, they, they built this model that made sense mathematically and then they tested it with real people and validated it. Um, but basically they found there's a lot of instances where if you're trying to signal your value to someone, you end up being better off sending less positive signals. So in the context of, of, of college admissions, and the, I go into the details in the book, but, but the, the, the conclusion of it is that in the context of college admissions, if you take a application and you put on it, so let's say, 10 activities that are all things that more or less are medium ability, right? You have to show up, you have to put in some hours, aren't particularly impressive take that application, then make a photocopy of that application where the only difference is you took off some of those activities. Counterintuitively, the application with the less activities is likely to be seen as more impressive, right? It, the, the, we're wired that way for a variety of reasons, um, and it's counterintuitive, and that's in some sense why they call it, uh, you can think of it as counter-signaling theory. Now, the details of why that is is a little bit more involved, but it, it, it shows up a lot in the admissions process, that adding extra little things can actually make you less impressive. So that's the third of my three arguments for why the students should be doing less, sticking with a small number of things. Yeah, in fact, you give a couple of examples in the book where your um, superstar will say, oh, I, I don't think I even put that on my admissions application. Yeah, that's very common with the relaxed superstars. They, they leave off activities that they were sort of involved with tangentially. They didn't even think to put it on their application. And in essence, what they were doing was stumbling, <laughs> in some sense, onto the counter-signaling effect. That probably helped them. OK, so the playbook for the law of focus included um, forming a deep interest, um, it also had something you had in there, the goodness paradox, that most people believe they know how to become good, yet most people are not good at things. So uh, how do, what, what do you tell students about that? Yeah, it, it is an interesting paradox, and it comes up a lot when you do advising with students in particular which is, you'll, you'll say to a student, for example, oh, I, uh, I give advice about making straight A's, for example. This is a reaction I used to get common to that is, oh, I could do that, but I want, you know, I want to have a life or something. You know, an assumption that, oh, I, I, I know how to do it, 
I know what what strategies get you good grades, and I, I understand the field, and, and you know I, I don't choose to do it. This shows up pretty common in, in, in student advising that students just have this assumption that I probably more or less know how things work, how to do it, how to get good at things, and this the question is whether or not I want to do it. And what I found with the relaxed superstars is that they realize for a lot of pursuits it's actually not obvious how to get good, and they they take the time to try to figure it out. So I give the example of this. Um, this one student who I call John, uh, who during high school, for example, was trying to get his English grade higher. He just, you know, he didn't feel like his writing was where it should be. English was tough for him. And instead of just assuming he knew what that meant, he went and found the girl in his class who was at the top of all the English tests, at the, in the most advanced English classes. The girl that everyone said, she's the writer, she understands literature. And he said, look, I'll, I'm good at math. Can I swap you know, math tutoring to get advice from you and work with you on how to be better at reading, how to be better at writing? And by the time he graduated, he was getting top grades in English as well. Right? And it wasn't just because he threw hours at it. It's because he said, I actually don't know what it is I'm not doing right here. And I'm going to go try to figure it out. So when I'm trying to, to, to give the advice to students in the law of focus that you should take something and get good at it, this is sort of a caveat. Don't just assume you know how to become really good at what you're doing and taking the thing you know to an interesting place. In some sense, assume you don't. And really take the time to go find people who have done it well and really understand what it was that mattered. So it, it, it's, it's an important point that I think a lot of students sidestep. But the students like these relaxed superstars who, who learn to leverage it get uh, great returns from it. Well, and it also seems to be the basis of your book, right? I mean, you went out and actually interviewed people who were doing things well to figure out what they were doing. Right. In some sense, it's the basis of my, my writing for students. It's always based on, uh, I guess, what they call positive deviance theory in the uh, sort of public health world, which is if you want to solve a problem, go find the people who aren't having the problem, ask them what they're doing different. Once you know, then tell the other people. Um, so in some sense, yeah, that's my whole approach to working in the student space. That's the whole point of this book. So yeah, you could, that's a good observation that the goodness paradox is basically saying, approach your student life like I approach this book. So in the playbook for the law of focus, you have immersion and uh, talk about that. And then you have something that's sort of counterintuitive, which is um, even though it's focus, it's sowing a lot of seeds in different places. Um, and, and then being willing to kind of drop the ones that don't work. How do you reconcile the focus with the willingness to put a lot of feelers out? Yeah, this question comes up a lot. And, and when I wrote some about this on my blog, it opened up a discussion online with some other bloggers as well. Because this is a, a big point of tension, I think, in the world of people who, who think and write about getting more out of life or making your life interesting. Uh, this is the type of thing that Chris Gabro, for example, would love to debate with me about and talk about. He loves these type of things, too. Um, is this idea, this tension between you have to do something really well before it starts to give you benefits, before it starts to really give you whatever, more freedom in your life, more opportunities in your life, or what have you. But if you're focused on something, you're not out there exposing yourself to lots of other things. So you might miss the op more you know interesting opportunities, things that you never knew were you know possible for you, and that's a tension, and it, and it is kind of hard to navigate. Um, and here's the way I try to I suggest to the students to navigate it: that when you start and you really don't know what you're interested in, you're out there exposing yourself broadly. You're, uh, one of the students I talked to in the book calls it exposure to bulk positive randomness. That was his words for it. If you're going to talks, you're reading books, you're online reading you know, bulletin boards and going to people's blogs, you're just exposing yourself broadly. Then something sticks and something starts to snowball into a deep interest. This is where, especially in the law of focus, I talk about narrowing that exposure window, but you're not closing it all together. So now you have your, your window of exposing yourself to things narrowed to being things related to that interest, but you're still exposing yourself to things. And it's sort of a new way of thinking about it. So once you sort of have this deep interest, you're you know, working on your book on computer game programming for teens or whatever, 
what I'm advising when talking about immersion is that you still, within that more narrow window, are constantly exposing yourself to interesting things. Um, I talk about John trying to become a good musician in that playbook and how he listened to music and he went to concerts and he read books about composers. So he was exposing himself to lots of things that were now within this narrower window. And that helps, right? That's sort of the fuel that helps keep this more narrow interest developing in interesting directions. So that's my way of navigating that. You start broad, exposing yourself broadly. Something snowballs to a deep interest, you close the window to be more narrow, but it's still not completely closed. You're still exposing yourself to things. It's just now being drawn from a more narrower selection of options. So the third law is the law of innovation. And you talk about um, uh, when it's hard to explain an accomplishment uh, and the failed simulation effect. What is the failed simulation effect? Right. So the failed simulation effect arose out of asking a really simple question. So I was, I was taking these relaxed superstars I had found. So people like Manish, who wrote that, that book on computer game programming for teens. Um, or Steve, who did that involvement with that advocacy group and went to the UN. And I just asked, why is this impressive? And this, it seems like an obvious question. Um, and I've done this exercise on my blog before. It's actually really hard to answer. Because every time you, you come up with an answer, OK, this is why I think Manish's book is impressive. You can then say, well, here's other examples of things that meet those same criteria that aren't so impressive. And it, so it becomes much harder. So you say, OK, I think what he did is impressive writing a book because that's unusual, right? This might be your answer. It's unusual. Teenagers don't usually write books. But then you say, well, wait a second. I don't know if this rule keeps, you know, holds water because what about a student who plays the glockenspiel? Like, that's unusual, but that's not as impressive as writing your own book. So then you might say, OK, well, he's really impressive because writing your book is hard, right? That takes lots of time. And that's why he's impressive. But then you might say, no, you know what? I can think of lots of activities, like becoming second chair violin in the county orchestra. That's probably harder, but doesn't seem as impressive. And you can do this game for a long time. It's actually really hard to come up with an answer to the question, why is Manish impressive or students like that, that actually holds that anyone you can think up that, that, that satisfies your criteria is also impressive. And the, the, the criteria I finally came up with that actually worked consistently was this idea that he's impressive because it's hard to explain how he did what he did. And that's what I call the failed simulation effect, because you can't simulate the steps he took to write a book in your head. You just don't know how a 17-year-old ends up with a book deal. And in sort of a neurological sense, that surprise, that failure of the simulation, makes you interested. You know, it makes you engaged with this person. So the failed simulation effect arose out of this really simple exercise of taking these really interesting, impressive people and trying to find an answer that actually held water. And this was the answer that, that the only one I could find that consistently worked. So if, if I understood correctly, you're also saying that sometimes these activities that are harder to understand cognitively how someone would get there, they, they seem a little more mysterious to us, may actually take a lot less time than another uh, activity somebody's doing. But if we kind of understand, oh, I, you practice music, you're going into symphony, you're going to play more, that uh, somehow they're less interesting to us because we understand the path to get there. Yep, that's right. And that's part of why I spent time on it is um, it's really important that you understand what you just touched on there. If you want to understand why these students are so relaxed, <laughs> if you want to understand the relaxed piece of the relaxed superstar, this plays a huge role in it. That when something is hard to explain, it is very impressive, but it's more or less unrelated to how hard the thing was to do. These activities that these relaxed superstars did were often hard to explain. They're very impressive. Um, but most of them weren't incredibly time consuming. None of them required some sort of genius level IQ or weird natural talent. And this is a lot of what allowed them to maintain a sort of interesting, non-stress lifestyle. And yet, 
still be impressive is exactly what you, you touched on. You know, things so hard to explain are impressive. It really doesn't matter how hard they actually were to do in terms of just the hours you invested and the stress they generated. So this is one of the great secrets of what allows students like Manish to leave school at lunch and yet still breeze in the Stanford. So we're going to switch the Q&A in just one moment. If you'd like to ask a question, um, feel free to use the icon that's the hand with the green up arrow at the bottom of your participant window. That will raise your hand and we can give you the microphone. Or you can put your question in the chat. And if you've asked the question in the chat and I've missed it, feel free to put it in again. Well, my final question would be, what's an appropriate role do you think for parents and teachers who read this book and like it? What, what, what can they start to do that would make a difference for their children or students? It's a good question. So what I usually advise to parents, um, for example, is that I'll say the right message, in my opinion, to give to a student is that, well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be successful in the sense of living up to your potential and standing out. That's something that's going to be important all throughout your life. But exactly because this is going to be important throughout your life, the most you need to figure out, one of the most important things you can do is figure out how do I be successful, how do I live up to my potential, while at the same time still enjoying the day-to-day, -day, enjoying the life I'm living now, feeling like it's a good life. If you can crack that, that's like the key right there. And high school, it's a perfect time to figure out how to do that, right? It matters how well you do in high school. It, it, it tells you what options you're going to have for college and beyond. Um, but that, that, that struggle is never going to go away. You still have to do well in college. You still have to do well in your job. So high school is the perfect time to learn how do I live up to my potential, have ambitions, and yet still enjoy my life right now. And I think it goes a really long way when students hear that message coming from writers or coming from parents or coming from teachers, right? That uh, to me, if you're staying up till 2 in the morning the, to get your grades, that's equivalent to you getting Ds because you're not studying, right? Those are both failures in my eyes. What, what, what me as a parent or what me as a teacher is trying to push to you is that it's good to, to, to be ambitious and live up to your potential, but you have to figure out a way to do it that's sustainable, that, that gives you a good life right now. And then at that point when a student says, okay, well, how do I do that? And you say it's hard, but we can work on it. You have books like mine and many others that are out there that start to provide some guidance. Here's ways to do it. So that's, that's the way I sort of approach my interactions with students. Uh, it's what I, you know, humbly advise, not being a parent myself, the parents or teachers, is this notion that sustainable success is something that you can role model, that you can emphasize, and that you can support a student to pick up. Good. So uh, the first question that I took note of was, uh, has your book been translated into any other languages? It, it's being translated to some. Uh, I don't know which, though, because it's a slow process. And believe it or not, my older books, which came out years ago, are still now still showing up You know, this year for the first time in various translated versions. So I'm, I'm kind of early in the process for this book because it's not too old. Um, but my last books came out in China, Taiwan, Korea, um, mainly on the Asian continent. So I don't know exactly which rights have been bought, but I know the rights that have been bought are over in that part of the world. So Kelly um, made a comment that his son was a relaxed superstar, but because of his test scores, didn't get into any of the schools he wanted to. Um, in the book, you do talk about a kind of categorizing the schools within your reach based on test scores. Do you want to go into that at all? Yeah, this is worth doing. Uh, I put this right up front in the book that the the sort of hard truth of college admissions is that the, the most important thing is your grades and test scores. And the, the very rough rule of thumb is that you can take any college, look at the Barron's Guide, and they'll tell you what the median 50% of students scored on the standardized test of accepted students and the class rank or GPA of the median 50% of students accepted to the school. 
And the rough rule of thumb is that if your grades and test scores are below the median 50% of the accepted students for a school, then outside of certain exceptions, you're probably not going to get accepted there, no matter what you do outside of your academics. If, on the other hand, you're healthily above the median 50%, you're probably going to get accepted to that school regardless <laughs> of what you're doing outside of your academics. If you're healthily in the middle 50%, that school is now a possibility, and that's when all the type of advice I talk about in my book becomes relevant. So that's a good foundation to lay. Your grades and SAT scores tell you what's on the table, and then you can start using this type of advice to shuffle those things around. So there, uh, Sid asked if there was a companion workbook being planned for the book, and then a, a couple of people have sort of um, agreed with that. Um, have you thought about making a companion workbook? So I, I guess my my workbook now would be my blog, Study Hacks, which is calnewport.com, which you can think of it as an interactive workbook. I mean, this is it's a site where it, you know students come, I write articles about this material, here's case studies, but also they send me questions, I answer questions, I post case studies. Okay, someone sent me this question, here's the answer I gave to them. So it's a sort of more interactive, evolving conversation on these topics. So my the sort of workbook I have for students, in some sense, is to come hang out on study hacks for a while, which is sort of how a lot of students uh, either begin their interest in these ideas or polish off their interest or of these ideas after they've read the book. Someone has offered to translate uh, into Russian, if you'd like. Jason wants to know if you've seen Waiting for Superman, and what did you think? I have seen Waiting for Superman. Um, usually the stance I take uh, on these type of, of issues is uh, issues surrounding education, the education process, be it teacher or teacher union issues like you see in Wayne for Superman or, or the type of issues like homework or whatever that's brought up in Wait to Nowhere, uh, the, the issues around race at the top versus, you know, um, No Child Left Behind, the big issues. It's basically I say the big ideas are interesting. Um, but they're they're not for me. In some sense, I'm keeping my focus on the small ideas, which is what's the piece of advice I can give to a student tonight that's going to make their life a little better tomorrow. So in some sense, I just stay agnostic on the big picture issues of how we should structure education, how we should teach the kids, and I keep my focus somewhat humbly on with the system we have right now, what's the one-on-one -on -one advice that can make a difference. Again, if you've asked a question in the chat and I missed it, I, I hope you'll post it again. Um, Cal, are teens more capable than we give them credit for? Absolutely. You know, I, I see this all the time, this advising. It's why I wrote the book uh, to the student, not to the parent, and it didn't hold any punches. I said, yeah, these are big, ambitious things I'm telling you to do. Because I think a lot of students, especially the type of students who who feel like they have the potential to, to go to college and, and do something with it, have incredible ability. And they have all this pent up potential and, and don't know where to put it. And I think if you, can, if you can give someone clear examples, here are students that put this potential somewhere really interesting, they made their life better, here's how they did it, here's how you can do it too, they jump at that opportunity. So I'm an optimist on the capability of teens. Mohammed is saying, um, can this book with win, How to Win at College be good for medical dental grad schools? What sort of advice do you give for college students not entering the workforce right after college? Sure. I, I think these questions get uh, about graduate study in particular become very fragmented. Or I guess it's safer to say my answers become fragmented because it, it, it really differs. So, I mean, for someone who's looking to go to, to grad school like I did to get a PhD to try to get a job in academia is a completely different thing. The dental school is completely different than um, law school. So, in some sense, yes, there's some general ideas in here that are sort of useful for life in general, but also there's a lot of really good specific advice for specific paths through college and beyond. Um, and I guess this would be a good application of the goodness paradox. Don't assume you know it. <laughs> so, uh, if you want to 
get an MBA, go to Chris Ye's website, ask the Harvard MBA, and ask them, you know, what matters? What should I be doing? If you want to go to dental school, do something similar. Um, so that's usually what I tell people in that situation is let's get specific and then we can we can talk about what makes sense. Um, there, there is a question about your Twitter account and if, if you want to put that in the chat that would be great. Um, before that was a question from Jeff who asked what what is the form of resistance you receive against your ideas? Well there's there's two forms, one that I'm more interested in than the other. So the form that I'm most interested in is what comes from the students themselves because they're the ones who are out there and living this and when they have objections to particular ideas, uh, I take it very seriously. Uh, all of the ideas I talk about have all been evolved through sort of working you know, with students and, and getting their feedback. So the resistance I get from students I take very seriously. For example, I did an event recently at a high school outside of Boston and one of the students raised a concern about the social isolation that could come along with underscheduling. That when you, you, you disconnect yourself from a large number of, of activities that are also uh, social activities. And this was a really good point and that's a really good piece of resistance and some of the relaxed superstars struggled on it. So I, I pay a lot of attention to the student resistance. The type of resistance I'm less interested in is that that comes from the really large advocacy organizations that are working with huge budgets to try to restructure education or this or that. And there's been instances where, you know, major organizations working on student stress, for example, have taken my books off of their recommended website because they didn't like that the title said, you know, how to become a straight A student or something because that was giving the wrong message that A's are good or something like that. I get a lot of that type of resistance, you know, which is to me it's philosophical, it's adults talking about, you know, what's the meaning of, of success and, and, and what's the, is Harvard really important and I don't care as much about that. I think that's too divorced from the students who are in my inbox this morning are stressed. So I, I, I get a lot of specific resistance from students that's great. I get a lot of general philosophical resistance from the sort of chattering class which I tend not to care about as much. Cal, we've reached the top of the hour. I'm going to clap here for you. Thank you so much for coming on and talking about the book. Uh, again, uh, How to Be a High School Superstar with Cal Newport. Uh, I loved the book. It got me really thinking and it's a high recommendation for me. Thanks, Cal. Thank you. This was, this was a lot of fun and these were great questions and, and I love talking about this stuff. So thank you for having me on. Really appreciate your coming on. Next week, the authors of The Invisible Gorilla and Troy Hicks on digital writing. Uh, thank you for uh, being with us tonight. Thanks if you're listening to the recording. Uh, we do try and finish on time, Cal, to be respectful of your time. So you are welcome to go. You do that by clicking at the top right of your screen, X, or file and exit. Uh, we'll stay on a couple more minutes for those who might want to have, have a follow up conversation or discussions. Um, but thanks again and have a great night. All right, thank you. Thanks for coming, everybody. Feel free to go. You don't need to stay. I'll stand for a couple of minutes if there's any kind of a follow-up. Um, I, th I thought that, that it, the book was fascinating and I'm sort of intrigued by the degree and I, I noticed that others are, that it seems to apply well outside of uh, just student lives, but clearly Cal's um, interest here was in talking directly to students. Uh, has anybody else read the book who want to make any kind of comments about it? Cal, I assumed that it would be helpful for you to go, but you're certainly welcome to stay. I notice you're answering questions, so feel free to add anything or grab the mic back if you'd like. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm in a particular... You're not using Facebook or Twitter. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I don't use Facebook or Twitter. That's partially because of my day job. I do a lot of mathematics and uh, I feel like I need to preserve my ability to focus. Um, but, I, you know, I, I will say, I know we talked a lot about the student angle, um, but I, I, I will re-support your initial point that I really are interested in these ideas and how they apply beyond the space of students. And I think they absolutely do. I'm a little bit more tentative to, to be declarative about it because it's not a space I understand as well. Um, 
but I'm really interested that you picked up on it, uh, and I, I think that's definitely an, an, an interesting way to approach the book. A couple of things that occurred to me related to that were um, kind of the formalization of that in an organization like Google with the 20% time. Um, but then I also thought about sort of the degree to which uh, large companies and organizations work much like the school environment where there's an expectation that you will look busy and be active and that um, kind of the same declaration of independence that a student might make from the uh, sort of culturally expected norms in order to have more success could be applied in the workplace as well. Yeah, just to throw out an idea I've been writing about recently that's more early, when I was looking at these same issues in life after college, because that's what's relevant to me right now, um, one thing I noticed is that in a sort of typical workplace, in order to sort of declare your independence, what's different about in the high school level is that you, in essence, have to back that up with some sort of skill you've developed uh, for something that's rare and valuable. Uh, in other words, you need what I call this sort of career capital in the workplace. This is what I, I've been noticing what's different about life after college and before. Is in life after college, you can still be independent and do interesting things, but you kind of have to earn it by first being uh, good at something that the world values. So this is, a, this is a rough idea, but it's something that I'm, I'm definitely interested in, this idea of accruing career capital. And then once you do it, being very, very thoughtful about how you invest it in terms of making your life into something more interesting. I think that has a lot of application for teachers because in particular teachers typically have a deep interest in things and the idea of actually cultivating and pursuing those over the course of time um, and then being able to put them into their career is compelling and, and um, attractive. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's, so it's, I think that's true. I think that's true, and I think it's it's um, just approaching these sort of issues about your career and how to make it interesting and how to make it more successful and how to build passion for what you do, just approaching these issues from the type of way we're talking about it now, the same sort of way I talk about high school, you know, college admissions, the sort of more systematic way, using words like laws, having hypotheses. I think it's that just general approach is really fruitful and, and something that's that's an exercise worth doing. And it's a good sort of uh, relief from just telling people, you know, follow your passion, have courage, and that's all great. But I, I, I think this type of discussion is, is sort of overdue for that space as well. Let's get a little bit more systematic. Let's kind of put our scientist hats on. I think it leads to interesting places. There's that goodness paradox again. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a lot. <laughs> That's the good news. The good news about having a, a sideline as a writer is there's a lot of interesting ideas that are out there to explore. Mohammed is asking, so is reading your books cheating, or should one come up with those ideas and live the lives of those you interviewed without getting help? How did you and those students come up with this and become so interesting? Yeah, that's the key question. I mean, a big part of the book is answering that. How do students end up doing these really interesting things? Um, and I don't think it's cheating. I think what you get coming out of my book is basically algorithms for your life that if you're running these sort of algorithms in your life, you're much more likely to be attracting interesting things into your life. You're much more likely to have really interesting things develop. Um, but it's much more, you're running these algorithms, unexpected things happen, they lead you to cool places, and much less, oh, I have a master plan that I got on page 50 or whatever, that it's secret, and I'm gonna, I've planned out, you know, step by step what I'm gonna do. So that's, that's, so it's not in some sense cheating. It's really about, here's the lifestyle they lead. Lead their lifestyle. Cool things will happen to you like it did to them, but you're not going to be able to predict what it is in advance. There was a question about gap years from Kelly in the chat that we didn't get a chance to get to, and, and I'm going to give a, a very short um, personal anecdote here. Our 18-year-old daughter is taking a gap year, and she's talked her way into an internship with a humanitarian organization. 
So rather than sort of paying the normal fees for a um, you know a short period of time, she's doing a six to twelve month internship, actually helping them do document stories and villages. And part of what the book did for me was I've, I've been feeling very supportive of this, but it gave me sort of this additional ammunition to support her in saying y you are going to discover things as you go along in this process and allow yourself to be open to that and, and, and allow yourself just to kind of enter into this not necessarily knowing where it's going to lead. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you 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 study these types of students, I mean, what if they're anything, what they are are masters of keeping their eyes open. And when interesting opportunities come up within whatever they're doing, they just have this sense of, then they get better at this, they have this sense of, oh, I'm going to jump at that. And that leads somewhere else interesting. And then something else kind of comes up and they say, oh, these different options, I'm going to go at that. And it's really exciting. It's a really fun way to approach life. So it, it sounds like, you know, your daughter's in the perfect situation to, to experience that and at the perfect time to do it as well. Um, so I'm glad you got that out of the book because I think that's absolutely right. I did appreciate that and uh, very much. And Kelly's saying she's trying to talk her 18-year-old into foregoing his first year of college. Yeah, I should I should mention there's a story in the book of a student Ben who it's about his gap year, um, and it, what's what's cool about the story is that he left uh, college uh, high school, um, unlike the other students in the book, not particularly that noteworthy. Uh, he actually had a very tough time in the college admissions process. Um, and he took this gap year where he, he said, I'm going to spend the entire gap year living basically this law of exposure. He's the kid who termed the coin, the coined the term exposure to bulk positive randomness. He's like, I'm going to go out there, no plans, expose myself to things. I'm going to travel the world, expose myself to things, follow up on it. You know, 18 months later, he had gotten a book deal, written the book, uh, become a regular commentator on NPR and like a popular speaker <laughs> around the country. You know, it happened in 18 months because he had gone into this gap year with with that philosophy. So I think it's good ammo for someone who's trying to support the idea of a gap year. There you go, Kelly. You've got some good ammunition. So we're at about 10 minutes past. Uh, I think we'll close it up now. Again, Cal, thanks so much. Loved the book. Um, really appreciate your coming on and spending time with us. All right. Thanks again, Steve. And thank you, everyone, in the, uh, the chat room for the interesting questions. I really loved them. Thanks again. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day or evening, depending on where you are. Um, hopefully, there's something coming up on our schedule that will be attractive to you. We appreciate your spending your time with us. Take care. Good night.